Thank you. Yeah, thank you for staying. Um, yeah, I hope I'm, I'm going to make this time uh, worth your while because uh, I'm going to talk about something rather specific, of course, uh, C and C++ standard library qualification, but I think the methods that, that I use are more generally applicable, so you may be able to use some of that for some other software as well. Um, yeah, yeah, the question of why am I here at this conference, because this is more, uh, my topic is more a functional safety uh, topic, of course. Um, but all of the software that you are developing in the end, by the time it gets on the road, uh, it will be written in C and C++, and, and then you better make sure that the tools that you work with are, uh, are suitable for that, that use case. Uh, also, um, before AutoSAR, uh, Adaptive AutoSAR, um, most of the, the safety critical software in the cars was rather limited. It was written in C. It didn't use many library functions um, because yeah, all of that added to the load of, of uh, yeah, the, the, the software qualification. And so um, budgets were limited there and, and uh, that changed with the coming of uh, Adaptive AutoSAR. Adaptive Autos are yeah, definitely added a lot more resources to, to available to the software developer, and also it added C++. And uh, yeah, that certainly made it possible for this software to be developed in uh, C++, even though uh, the ecosystem of, of safety, uh, functional safety um, methodology for, safety, for C++ uh, is not as well advanced as it was for, uh, for C. So the, and that is still the case. I'll, I'll show you an example later. Now, and obviously also, and that is directly related to the topics here, is that um, yeah, uh, uh, advanced driver assistance systems, uh, they deal with real-time sensors. There's a lot of data processing being done there, and you want to use libraries that, that are often written in, in C and C++. So, uh, then you get to C++, and as I said, you better make sure that your tools are uh, um, at the right quality level for that. So I'm going to talk uh, about qualification of, of, of these libraries, uh, and then we turn to the ISO 26262 standard, part 8, clause 12. There's a specific clause that, that says something uh, about how this standard applies to software libraries for third part, from third-party suppliers. And that can be uh, off-the-shelf software, commercial off-the-shelf software, but it can also be uh, open-source software. And uh, in particular for the C++ libraries, uh, yeah, there are not so many good C++ libraries. Uh, and in fact, the two best C++ libraries are in fact uh, open-source libraries for, for GNU and uh, LLVM. So what do you need to do for uh, the qualification of such, such libraries? Well, you have to show um, requirement coverage in accordance to part six of ISO 26262. So this refers, this, this section uh, refers to uh, part six of the ISO 26262 standard, and that is all about software, general, uh, software development in, in general. And primarily uh, the method to uh, do the, the qualification of these libraries is based on requirements-based testing. Additionally, there's also a requirement for code coverage. If you want to do ASLD, then you also need to uh, uh, do your code coverage and your MCDC uh, analysis. So we're going to look at, at a requirement-based test uh, for uh, the C and C++ standard library. Where, where do they come from and how do they fit in the big picture? So the big picture is this. This is uh, yeah, sort of the, the, the V model. Um, where the red, bit, the red bits are uh, what's involved in the, in the qualification of, uh, of the library. So on the left side, we need uh, uh, the requirements for the C or C++ library. Uh, I've separated that from the, the standards, the ISO C and C++ standards. Uh, one good thing, of course, is that we have uh, libraries for the uh, C and C++, uh, that we have ISO standards for uh, C and C++. Now, it is often thought that these libraries are uh, a good specification. Well, they are a good specification, but they're not a list of requirements. So we really separate the standard from the requirements, and we'll see in a moment why that is. Now, if you do have the requirements, then you can start building on your, your test suite. You define test specifications for every 
requirement, and based on that, you can build your requirement-based test. And finally, you need some reporting when you run your test. Um, then you create your uh, test reports, and you show in the test reports yeah, the traceability all the way from the test results back to the, uh, the C standard and the, the C++ standard. Uh, that provides you uh, a level of proof that uh, you have correctly implemented the specification of the, of the standard. Additionally, the, the box below is about uh, code coverage. Uh, I, I yeah, I, uh, specifically put it a little bit lower because uh, you need to look into the software itself. So you get to the level of unit testing if you want to do that uh, uh, in the right way. Okay, where do these requirements come from? Well, here we have uh, the picture from, the, there was actually a book one day, that was the C99 standard, that was published in a book, uh, which was very nice. They don't do that anymore, but uh, this is the front cover of that, that book. Uh, but now we have, uh, at this time, we do have actually uh, four C standards from C19 up, up to C18. We have five C++ standards from C++ 11 to 20. Although, um, yeah, uh, th these modern C++ developments, they all start with C++ 11. So uh, we actually try to ignore C++ uh, 03 from, from the functional safety perspective. Um, Here's an example of, of the, uh, from the C standard. This is about the STRN copy function. This is all the text that there is about that function, the whole specification uh, for that function, except for a footnote that I haven't copied, but uh, there, there's an additional footnote as well. I'm going to uh, zoom into this, this text a little bit. So the STRN copy function, it copies from uh, DRA S2 to DRA S1 for a limited number of characters, n characters, so that you see, find those parameters in the, in, the, in the prototype of the function. Now, if you look at the text uh, description there, the bottom two uh, lines, the, the green ones, they are nice, nice requirements. The, the, the final one is, is really the STRN copy function shall return the value of S1. Okay, it doesn't contain the word shall, but you can read that there. Um, the, the, the other line, the bit longer line, is also a very nice specification. It says, if this is the case, then that has to happen in this way. So those two are fine. But then we get to the yellow one. Um, and that says, if copying takes place between objects that overlap, the behavior is undefined. So it's sort of, it, you read it in this context as, okay, this is a requirement on the, on the function implementation. But it's not a requirement on the implementation. It is actually a precondition to the pro for the programmer. It's something that the programmer has to make sure is not happening. So the, this, the, and then the C specification and, and also the C++ specification, they're not very good at separating what is a requirement for the implementation and what is a requirement for the, the programmer. And uh, it would have been much better that this yellow part would have gone in, in a section that's called preconditions, which says, uh, objects S1 and S2 should not overlap or shall not overlap. Uh, but that's not the case. So, so you have to be careful interpreting this. And this is a quite uh, fairly easy case in terms of uh, recognizing that it's not a requirement on the implementation. Uh, but um, there are more ambiguous cases as well where it doesn't really say about undefined behavior, for example. But the real problem is the, the first sentence, the orange part, because that is supposed to tell what the SDRN copy has to do. And, and yeah, well, most of you, if you're programmers, then you know what it has to do. Uh, but if you read this as is, it is a very strange sentence because it says the SDRN copy function should copy not something, it should copy not more. So it, it doesn't really say that it has to copy something. It only puts a restriction on what, what it has to copy. So, and, and this one sentence actually yeah, it covers two cases of, of uh, copying, whether or not the string you're copying uh, is, is more or less, uh, has a length more or less than n. Um, and these two cases are written in this one sentence in a rather convoluted way, and it's so convoluted that they recognize themselves where we need an additional footnote here to explain that. So instead of writing down the two cases nicely, um, they made a very strange sentence out of that that actually doesn't 
put any requirement on copying anything at all in the strn copy function. So these are the kind of things you find in the, the C specification. I'm not saying that it's a bad specification. Um, I would say that the C++ specification is not my favorite because a lot of, many more things are left implicit in the C++ specification. Um, but these are the things you have to parse and, 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 and uh, yeah, really, you need to turn this into requirements in order to make a good test suite. Um, so we get them, we end up with these six uh, requirements that are actually written in such a way that you can test them as well. Uh, the top two that are the green ones that correspond to the bottom two sentences, so that was okay. The two orange ones correspond to the one orange sentence, and that's now split up into two cases. The case where the length of the string is less than n, and the case of the, uh, and the other case, basically. Uh, and then the two blue ones, they're not specific, specified in the text at all. They're, they're based on expertise of, yeah, when you know uh, about the implementation, a little bit about the implementation of the strn copy function, you know that it's very easy to copy one character too many, too many. And, and that is a situation that you do not want to run into because then you're writing possibly outside of your memory or you're overwriting something that you should not overwrite. And uh, that's a serious issue. Um, and that is not made explicit in the specification and it doesn't have to be explicit because the specification is written in the, in the, in the, in the style of if it doesn't say that something has to happen, then it should not happen and it shall not happen. So, uh, but we have to make a test for that. We have to test that we do not copy too many characters and, and go beyond the nth character that we are allowed to, uh, to copy. So those two bottom ones are, are not explicit. We have to think about that and we have to interpret the text and, and add them also to our uh, list of requirements. We see here that the, um, uh, the one uh, yellow sentence doesn't co come back anymore uh, because that is not a requirement on the implementation. It's something that the programmer is responsible for and that is not something we can uh, validate in the library itself. Uh, where do then the, the test come from? Uh, we have the requirements now here, and then, then uh, we refer to this part six of ISO 26262, and it has a nice table here, table eight. Some of these tables in ISO 262, you can, can pick one of the, uh, the cases, but in the, this case of table eight, you really have to go through all four of these cases. You re really try to read the requirements, you analyze that, you try to figure out, okay, what is a fitting test for that, you have to think um, about your, your uh, input values, the input cases that you put in there. Uh, you have to divide those into equivalent classes. You have to think about boundary cases. So that's the uh, 1C uh, line in this, in, this, um, in this table. And the final one is where the two blue lines came from. Um, it, it's called here error guessing, but yeah, I would love to uh, call it, uh, yeah, leveraging the experience that you have as a programmer, as a designer in, in, in finding out, okay, what are the cases that you can also run into and have you have to make sure that uh, things go well. So, um, error guessing is a little bit of a, a, a loose term, but uh, it's definitely something, yeah, it, it sounds a bit creative and it doesn't fit in a process, but it's really something that you have to, uh, Keep in mind as well if you develop requirements and test cases. So in the end, if you have your, uh, yeah, your requirements-based test suite and you run that, then out of that for, this is coming out of the, the C uh, qualification run for the C18 library, and then you get a spreadsheet filled with lines like this, and this is a very small section out of this. The, the, the whole spreadsheet is about uh, 4,000 lines for uh, C18 library, the standard C18 library. Uh, and it has a lot of, um, yeah, very detailed requirements, uh, test specifications and, and tests. And you see that uh, every line uh, at the right side, we have the final test result. Uh, one column before that, there is the test reference. That is the test that was valid, uh, uh, verified. Then we have the test specification, the, the requirement, the identifier of the requirement has its own column, and then the first two are referring 
specifically to where this comes from in the uh, C18 uh, standard library specification. And yeah, this, this report you can then use for, uh, in your final documentation of the, the qualification process. So a little bit about, uh, about code coverage. Um, code coverage is, is a method to uh, ensure that you haven't forgotten any cases. It's, it's quite easy uh, to develop your requirements, of course, and, and then there may be tricky cases that you still have forgotten. And in order to uh, make sure that you didn't do that, you go from the other side. Instead of reasoning from the specification uh, down to the test, you're now going to look at how well does your test suite cover all of the implementation code that you have here uh, in, in, the, um, in the implementation of the library. And if we do that for, for this function, the fresp function, which splits a floating point number into its mantissa and exponent, uh, and we run our, our test case, then you might find that you have a couple of lines that are not covered. So the red ones, line 16 is not touched by our test suite, line, uh, lines 11 and 12 are also not touched by the test suite. And if you look carefully at lines 10 and 15, there's are annotations about the branches, and we see that the branches are not taken in two ways. So the two red lines indicate where uh, we haven't covered the test. And uh, if we then go analyze that, then we figure out um, yeah, what are the values that are not, uh, not, not correctly input here or missing from the input here. And then we have to yeah, not just add that to the test suite, but we have to think, OK, how do those values correspond to our original specification? Because in the end, we want to have a test that is rooted into the, into the specification. Now, these two cases, they, they correspond to subnormal floating point numbers. So those are very tiny floating point numbers, very close to zero, uh, which have a special format in, in the encoding of floating point. And the other case has to do with not a number values and infinities. And uh, both of those are covered by this one line. Uh, but there are two different cases, actually, not a number and then we have uh, even a positive and a negative infinity. They're all handled by this line, but you would add these three cases to, uh, to your test suite as well. And uh, yeah, you can actually refer back to the specification about what these numbers are about. Um, a little bit more difficult, and this is when I, I get to the point where, where I show that the, the, the ecosystem of tools for uh, uh, functional safety is, is not really that mature yet for C++. Uh, code coverage in C++, you can get uh, yeah, uh, uh, partial results, actually. Uh, this result is uh, yeah, not correct, and it's also not complete. Um, and the reason for that is that in C++, we have templates, we have compile time evaluation of const experts, and that means that it's very hard to instrument that code because it's all executed by the compiler itself before it actually goes into the car or to the road. A lot of this code is already executed by the compiler and, uh, and that is, makes it invisible to the, um, to the code coverage analysis tools. Unless you specifically put, uh, yeah, try harder in your analysis tool to make that run better. So if we look at the results here, we can look at lines uh, 14 and 16. We've seen the, they, they're not marked at all. So the um, code coverage analysis tool does not recognize those lines as uh, executable code. And the reason is that, that those two lines are executed at compile time and, and they're not visible at runtime. Uh, also, we see that line 14 uh, is executed and it calls the function foo, which is the top level function on lines one, two, three. And the analysis tool has seen that there is a foo here, but it has marked it all red. It cannot see that it has been executed. And again, that is because line 14 is executed uh, completely at, at compile time and it's not visible uh, by the runtime analysis output of the code coverage tool. So um, yeah, then you get incomplete results and um, that, that makes your uh, C++ code co coverage analysis uh, quite a bit harder because you have to work harder to uh, ensure that everything is, 
is correctly covered. Okay, now um, coming back from, from our requirements-based test suite and, and running the test, uh, the higher level process of qualifying a third-party library, um, this is what we do for, for the C and C++ libraries, but this is also applicable to other libraries. If you would want to use a machine learning library, you could basically use the same methodology and, and apply that. Uh, so step one is to document your baseline, which is, okay, identify what uh, library you're exactly qualifying, what tools you're using, uh, what versions there are, uh, what documentation there is for the library, uh, all those things. And also you have to take some responsibility for that library because you are using it, you have done the qualification, and you need to define some kind of library management process. And that can be as simple as uh, yeah, just defining uh, 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 an error tracking. So if you find uh, issues uh, in the library that you make a note of that and, and uh, act on those, those issues. Second step is that you are going to verify your library with a requirement-based uh, test suite. So that's what we saw and that, that you get a, a large uh, spreadsheet out of that with traceability info. Um, you're going to do your uh, cover, code covers analysis and you may have to extend your uh, test suite with implementation specific tests for this implementation. You do need source code for uh, code coverage analysis, of course, and that may make it more difficult to uh, qualify third party libraries that you only get in binary. So uh, this is actually a, an uh, argument in favor of, uh, of open source libraries. Uh, then step three is that you analyze your test failures. Um, you are going to find some failures in, in, the, in, the, in the library. Um, and uh, yeah, you have to analyze that, those. Uh, you do not have to fix them. Uh, if you do fix them, then you basically have to redo your qualification process. You are allowed to have failures in your tests, uh, but then you need to deal with them and you have to make sure that they don't end up in your uh, source code. Uh, when you uh, are using uh, the library. So you have to define mitigations that uh, those are workarounds that can be used to avoid uh, getting running into those t test failures, those failures of the uh, library in your actual uh, application. And finally, step four is to create a report, to wrap everything uh, together. You have your traceability from the specification to the test and back. Your mitigations become a safety manual for the users of the, the library. Um, and all of that you can then uh, present if you want to uh, uh, an assessor uh, and they can certify that the process has been handled in the right way and put a, a certificate uh, stamp on that that says, okay, you've properly done the qualification process and um, we certify that it's done properly. Okay, that is what I wanted to uh, tell you, so um, let's end it here. Uh, if you want to uh, talk to us, uh, you can contact us, my, my, me directly, uh, but okay, I'm a bit slow with email, um, <laughs> so maybe better to send it to Envo. Um, and if there are any questions, then... Uh, yes, thank you I'm so much, here. Marcel. <laughs> Do we have questions for Marcel today? Yes, great. Interesting work. Uh, thanks for the presentation. So, I was wondering, um, were there any attempts to take some of these libraries and then do formal verification of those? Taking the requirements and then formalizing it, and then instead of testing them, just do uh, full formal verification. So you want a lot more formal proof of, of right. the correctness of the mm. library. Yeah, we've looked at that for, um, uh, for the C library. Mm -hmm. um, for some parts of the library, it's quite doable. We've, we've used uh, the Frama C framework. I don't know if you've known that, right. if you've known that, but uh, especially, for example, the string copy function, uh, that, that fits quite well with the Frama C formalism. 
Um, so there uh, you can really describe, okay, these are your preconditions, and then if you have that, you can make the tool prove that the source code is indeed producing the right results. Uh, for the other function, and that's actually funny that, that both of them are here, we found that it's much more complicated because that was uh, the floating point function splitting up um, a value, a floating point value, manipulating the bits to mm -hmm. get out of the float point of value and, and, and produce uh, results out of that. That is very difficult to handle in, in, in Frama C. And I, it may be due to Frama C, but you can imagine in general that uh, this conversion from values, floating point values, which, which are again different from real values, which is what the proofs themselves would are easy, more, easily to, more easily deal with, uh, these three steps, that is very complicated to, to do that right. So we, we did not succeed to provide nice methods to do that. So you, with, with a lot of work, you can, can get it right here, but it looks awful. And, and that means that if your proof looks awful, yeah, what is the value of your proof? If, if the proof is so much more complicated than your software itself, there is less value in the, in the proof. And, and interestingly, um, proving software correct is one of the methods that is also mentioned in ISO 26262 uh, part six. Um, I believe in the previous version that that was ranked with a single plus actually for ASLD. They may have upgraded that to, to two pluses now, but originally in the original standard that was ranked below uh, mm -hmm. the, test, the, the requirements based testing method. And, yeah, from our experience, I can see a little bit why that is because, okay, maybe we were limited by Prima C. I don't think that that was the problem, but sometimes these proofs are very complicated. So, so one more question is, I think um, you said that if the function is not defined for some inputs, right? So, so it could be possible that, right, these are essentially assumptions, right? So, so you call the function some yeah, assumptions. Yeah, preconditions. Yeah. So what happens if that precondition is violated and the function is called? There could be some uh, yeah, issues. That's, that's a very serious safety hazard if right. that happens. So, but it's not something we can verify at the level of the implementation of the library itself. In order to catch that, we have to look at the application that uses the library. And then you use other tools, uh, static analysis tools, and maybe uh, in, in, in the uh, yeah in, in LLVM you can can add uh, analysis uh, instrumentation, uh, additional instrumentation code in the in the software to catch those cases. Um, it, it cannot be done at the level of the library itself. You need to have the application together with the library. But there are other tools for that. So static analysis tools. Uh, following programming guidelines, uh, and they help you avoid those undefined behaviors. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Any last question for myself today? No? Great, thank you so much, Marcel, for thank joining us. Thank you very us. much. All right.